I have to apologize. All right. Ugh. Our scripture, oh, it's so exciting. Wow. Our scripture today comes from Genesis 32. We'll be reading, oh gosh, uh, 22 through 31. So um, I'm reading the common English version, but you're if you've got a different one that you want to read, you're welcome to do that. Jacob got up during the night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his 11 sons and they crossed the Jabbok River, shallow water. He took them and everything that belonged to him. And he helped them cross the river. That was nice of him. But Jacob stayed apart by himself. The man wrestled with him until dawn broke. When the man saw that he couldn't defeat Jacob, he grabbed Jacob's thigh and tore a muscle in Jacob's thigh as he wrestled with him. The man said, let me go because the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And J he said to Jacob, what is your name? And Jacob said, Jacob. Then he said, who fights with someone you don't know? <laughs> um, then he said, your name will be Jacob. And it won't be Jacob any longer, but it will be Israel because you struggled with God and with men and won. won. Jacob also asked, said, tell me your name. And he said, why do you ask for my name? And he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel because I've seen God face to face and my life has been saved. The sun rose as Jacob passed Peniel limping because of his thigh. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Perfect. Thank you, Sonicia. All right. Jacob is going home. Home to his brother Esau, whose inheritance Jacob swindled out of him. And to be clear, this is not the first time that Jacob has swindled or deceived one of his relatives. It's just one of many. Jacob is truly a morally gray character. Perhaps that's what makes him so fascinating. He's neither wholly good nor wholly bad. He's totally and completely, wholly, perfectly human. Diverse mix of failings and triumphs of wrongdoings and righteousness. And here in our scripture today, we have one of those very morally gray moments, or at least it's leading up to one. So Jacob is going home. For the first time in decades, he will see Esau, his older brother, and his twin. Someone he's been running for, running from for years, he'll finally see face to face. Jacob is terrified, terrified of Esau's anger and what his retribution will look like, because it turns out Esau has a freaking army of people in his camp, and he's been very successful despite not having the launch pad of his inheritance, the inheritance his brother, Jacob, stole from him. So in true Jacob fashion, rather than face something straight on, he sneaks about. In the middle of the night, he rouses his entire household, has them break camp, the, the Bible does tell us he at least helps them do this. It's like a fun thing, you know, that Jacob does that's a river. And it was shallow. So it wasn't like a raging river, right? Like a little, little stream. So again, like still a questionable decision, Jacob. Okay, in the middle of the night, it's dark. They have street lamps. They're doing this in the middle of the night. They're crossing water and children. There's children in this. And he helps them set up camp on the other side of the river, right? So like, and then what does he do? Scoops back across the river from a scary cat and doesn't stand with them. Why? Because what if Esau came in the middle of the night to exact his retribution decades old? Now, at least Jacob has forewarning by putting his entire family at risk. So yeah, he abuses his entire family, including his wives and his children, as a buffer. Not only is he a coward, he's kind of a jerk who leverages his power as the male leader to put the most vulnerable in the population who cannot argue with him at risk. He's putting them in potentially harm's way, harm that he is trying to avoid. I would say here that right now, we're not just seeing Jacob as this like potentially morally gray character but morally bankrupt jacob is being the worst the brothers these two brothers and their history of grudges have a lot to teach us because while jacob has been carrying on this fear 
fear and potentially guilt for what he did, what he imagined will happen when he sees Esau, he has this anticipation of what will happen, which in reality is just a reflection of his own thoughts and perhaps how he would react. On the other hand, we learn later this kind of story, like they, those, all of his grudging stuff happened. Here's our story today. And then their encounter is not something we've read about. But later we learn when they do encounter, Esau greets his brother with joy. And he says, like, I've missed you. Esau has actually no, held on no ill will towards his brother. Esau has made the best of his circumstances and has become successful in his own right. Like I said earlier, he has an entire camp of people, basically an army. Maybe the takeaway here is possibly that Jacob's fear of retribution just shows you more about Jacob than it does Esau. So we have Jacob hiding out on the other side of the river between him and this assumed threat of his older brother, which we know, you know, in reflection that it's not. And he's woken up by someone wrestling him. He probably believes he's fighting for his life, right? He probably believes that Esau has shown up or sent one of his people and this is it. Like he is struggling for his life. He doesn't know who his assailant is, but the fear of attack has pervaded his thoughts and shaped all of his actions so far. So for him, this is a struggle of life and death. And the writer notes when the person that he's struggling with, who Jacob is struggling with, saw that he could not defeat Jacob. He grabbed Jacob's thigh and tore a muscle as he wrestled with him. I mean, if you were wrestling and you are like, ooh, I don't think I can win, so I'm going to tear this person's thigh, it does sound like you could have won because you, like what in the, what, I'm sorry. I just want to know like, how do you think that happened? Okay, so I obviously have questions about the scripture writer's story. So dawn is breaking and Jacob's attacker asks to be released from the, from in, after, even after injuring Jacob, they're still fighting. And Here's the question that many people want to know about scripture and this, especially the story. What does Dawn have to do with Jacob's assailant asking to tap out? We have no idea. Different people have said different things. Is it because it will reveal to Jacob who he is actually facing? What will the Dawn light show? We don't know. But as Dawn breaks, the wrestlers break apart with the demand of a blessing. And before the blessing begins, the assailant asks Jacob his name. Then, with this knowledge, the attacker gives Jacob a new name, Israel. No longer will Jacob's name mean heel, so like the back of your, you know, Achilles heel, which was associated with his grasping because he came out of his mother holding on to his brother's heel, so the one that grasped the heel. It also has this underlying tone of someone who um, kind of comes at things from the side, kind of shady, which tracks, it turns out for Jacob, <laughs> turns out his name was very on brand. But all of a sudden, he is given a new name, a new understanding. His name is Israel, God wrestler. Jacob asks the assailant then, what is your name? And the person enigmatically answers, why do you ask? Perhaps that question also reveals a little more about what this assailant or who the assailant is. Perhaps it is said with sarcasm, do you even need to ask my name? Is it not obvious? I mean, they give Jacob a new name that says he wrestled with God. Is that a hint? Jacob's response to the encounter potentially is also another clue as to whom Jacob wrestled with. Jacob's response is to name the area Peniel because Jacob had seen God face to face and his life had been saved, which is probably a really good response. Like he was not like, and I was awesome. No, I wrestled with God and like, thank God I came out of that alive, right? Perhaps then that's our answer is that the person or the representative that Jacob struggled with was in fact a divine entity sent from God. Whoever it was, Jacob crosses the river the next morning with marks from the encounter, a physical reminder of what occurred, of wrestling with the divine. And he's been renamed and ideally transformed. He has a new identity. Perhaps you can hope that this transformation is, allows Jacob to be a little bit more authentically himself. No more pretense, pretending he has it all together, pretending to be someone he's not, no longer is his name linked with his identity, with his relationship with his brother, 
but it's a new name that's a new identity forged by his own actions, forged not at his birth, but in his choices as an adult. Perhaps now with this new name, equipped with a new name, he can be a little more real, a little more authentic. Perhaps he can leave behind the distrust and the grudges, both real and imagined, and forge a new future that is authentic and real in a way that he has not yet lived. Perhaps he can transform also his relationships because he's also been in this understanding of transformation. For me, Jacob can teach us a lot, mostly on what not to do. Jacob, now Israel, is fantastic proof for me that literally no one is too far from God because even Jacob <laughs> is close to God, despite being super shady most of the time. So this is good news, right? This is great news for us because like, Jacob made a lot of bad mistakes and like is also seen as like a hero in the Bible, which again, questionable. But Jacob shows us that all persons on the journey have a journey with the divine and that that journey is not expected to be smooth. It's going to be bumpy. And honestly, a lot of people are like, that's not great news. And I'm like, I think it is actually, because most of us probably have not experienced life that is completely like easy. And so when we're like, is this normal? Actually, yeah, like our journey is one that is complex because we are complex individuals. Just like the journey will be bumpy, it does not mean, and this is for me very important, what Jacob teaches us. It also means for us that we do not always have to agree with God. I love the knowledge that we can argue or wrestle with God. And I think also argue or wrestle with scripture. This realization, hopefully for you, is liberating. It can free us from the misconception that we have to be free of doubt, free of questions. It doesn't mean that we have to always agree with God or with scripture or even the church. This freedom, of course, can be scary, right? It means that we, the church and perhaps scripture don't have all the answers for us. Um, it means that maybe all our questions don't have answers. It means that faith isn't as this concrete, solid thing, but malleable and tangible. It ebbs and it flows. It means that faith, like doubt, can come with questions. It means that there might be more uncertainties than there are certainties on our journey. But once again, we have Jacob to remind us that despite the bumps, despite the questions, despite the uncertainties, we have freedom to argue and wrestle with God, and that in that, no one is too far from God that God shows up even in our wrestling and even in our doubt, despite our mistakes. And God allows us and invites us into a journey of transformation. So for me, I think Jacob is actually perhaps maybe not a hero or a role model, but a great example of what it means to live the life of faith. And so as we enter into open space, um, we're going to have some opportunities to think about the journey. And as perhaps like not thinking up Jacob as like our role model, because like ideally not morally great people is what we want to be. But, um, you know, it's a time to think about um, the freedom that we're given to engage with God um, and to think about the questions that um, scripture invites us into and also like the things that we disagree with in scripture, right? Like maybe you missed it, but like this starts with, Jacob and his two wives, I have questions, okay? I've got questions starting there. So maybe there's like, that is very obviously very simple, but there's other things in scripture that perhaps in before the church has said, oh, this is exactly what you have to believe. And Jacob is like, uh, not actually, you can believe a lot of different things and also struggle with scripture and also have doubt. And that doesn't make you less of a Christian. It doesn't make you less of a believer or less worthy. And so um, I'm definitely someone who uh, likes to sit in this experience of doubt and questions. And I think for me, that's where I like to be. And so I invite you into that space as well. Um, and so we're going to do that. We're going to be in that space of thinking about the questions we have, thinking about the doubts we have, and not seeing those maybe as negatives, but as positives and parts of the journey. And so as we enter into open space, there's time for you.